backyard. Now, I've had a lot of fun times hanging out back here with family and friends, but a lot of the time, the conversation actually turns to be about these hooks. When we moved in, some of the hooks were facing this way, while others were facing this way instead. Now, which way is correct? I've heard a lot of strong opinions on either side of this debate, but one way has to be better than the others. Let's let the power of the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem settle the debate for us. Our goal is to test each orientation of the hanger, this way and this way, to see which way experiences less stress under an equal load. Step 1. We'll complete a full 3D scan of the hook in order to generate a mesh file that represents the hook's size and shape. Step 2. Using this mesh file, we'll use the power of Geomagic for SOLIDWORKS and SOLIDWORKS mesh tools to generate a fully featured SOLIDWORKS model. Step 3. We'll run a linear static stress analysis on each orientation of the hook using consistent fixtures and loading. Step 4. After determining the orientation that results in the least stress, we can flip all the hangers to be in that orientation and finally end the debate. We begin with step 1, completing a 3D scan of the hook. To do this, we'll use the Artex Space Spider. This scanner takes pictures at over 7 frames per second to a 3D resolution of 0.1 millimeters, which should be perfect for our application. After completing multiple scans and fusing the results together, we are left with a mesh that can be exported in many different file formats. In this case, we'll export as an STL. Now that we have a mesh file of the hook, we move to step two, reverse engineering the scan. Geomagic for SOLIDWORKS is amazing for extracting surfaces and other information directly from the scan file. Since 2018, SOLIDWORKS has added great new functionality for extracting this information from the mesh as well. Combining these two tools and SOLIDWORKS surfacing and solid modeling, we're quickly able to create a highly accurate version of our part. Using this model, we're on to step three. This is where we can use a linear static simulation to evaluate our hook. We'll apply an appropriate material, fixtures, mesh refinement, and a five pound load applied to a small section near the end of the hook. We can copy the simulation to ensure identical material, fixtures, and mesh, and simply redefine our load to be in the opposite direction on the appropriate face. After running both studies, we're able to directly compare the results and see that when the hook is installed this way, the stress is noticeably less. So that's it. With the power of SOLIDWORKS, we were able to conclusively decide which way we should put these oh, hooks. Come here, please. My wife said she wanted them the other way. How do you know your designs will perform in the field? Maybe you use the experience and judgment of your engineers, or perhaps you perform hand calculations on any areas of concern. These traditional forms of design validation have, for the most part, worked for as long as engineers have been creating the world of tomorrow. However, as digital design practices have become commonplace, businesses both small and large have incorporated virtual simulation tools to simultaneously reduce their validation expenses while also improving the quality of their final designs. Best judgment and hand calculations can be very effective means of determining if a specific area of a part will fail from a specific load. Unfortunately, the limited scope of these methods simply does not allow engineers to gain broad enough insight into the overall performance of their designs, necessitating the use of multiple physical prototypes and large factors of safety. Simulation tools such as SOLIDWORKS Simulation allow engineers to apply many different conditions and loads to their designs concurrently, making it possible to test full designs against their actual operating conditions. The results of these simulations can be thoroughly interrogated to find any areas of concern, rather than needing to identify these areas before beginning the validation process. By incorporating nonlinear simulation, it is even possible to observe the failure mode of the design and any secondary failures that might occur. 
With tools like SOLIDWORKS eDrawings, simulation results can be shared with ease, meaning that the days of reviewing convoluted spreadsheets are over. Perhaps the greatest hurdle to overcome when considering the introduction of a simulation software is the idea that simulation tools are simply a replacement for hand calculations in the validation process. In reality, a simulation solution enables designers and engineers to include considerations for validation early in the design process and allows them to test a range of concepts and options without additional cost or lead time. SOLIDWORKS Simulation operates entirely within the SOLIDWORKS CAD environment, allowing designers to quickly transition between validation and modeling. Any concerns identified during a simulation can be immediately addressed in the CAD model and then tested with the original study setup. Being able to design and validate iteratively from any point in the design process saves thousands of dollars and days to months of time when compared to physical prototyping. The ease of analysis with SOLIDWORKS Simulation also allows users to quickly compare the results of many different options, enabling them to optimize the performance of their design while still minimizing costs. It's true that many SOLIDWORKS Simulation users still validate their results with calculations and physical prototyping. But the scope and quality of virtual simulation results makes it easy to accurately target and minimize the use of these traditional methods while also reducing the costs associated with unnecessarily large factors of safety. SOLIDWORKS Simulation is not simply an alternative to hand calculations. It's a tool that enables engineers to combine their design and validation efforts, which produces more innovative designs that get to market faster. Reach out to us today to start incorporating virtual simulation into your design process. Congratulations. Your business is successful and growing. But along with business growth comes data growth and data complexity. We've helped you get a handle on data with SOLIDWORKS PDM, but until today, you may have had other business management needs we didn't meet. Well, now with SOLIDWORKS Manage, we can tame your data complexity. You can now have advanced bill of materials, connected project management, and advanced process control, so you can continue growing without getting lost in the data. First, let's talk about bill of materials. They get complex, and spreadsheet after spreadsheet can get out of control quickly. SOLIDWORKS Manage can keep your bill of materials connected and under control. You can create them any step of the way, even before a SOLIDWORKS model is even started. When you need it, additional options can be added to create a complete, comprehensive bill of materials. Whether adding additional materials like paint, Loctite, or grease, specifying options like color or size, or creating variants for different regional markets. Do you rely on Microsoft Project or Excel for project management and task assignment? They're good basic tools, but they are disconnected from your SOLIDWORKS design data. SOLIDWORKS Manage enables you to create project plans, view Gantt charts, and assign tasks, like you might using Microsoft Project. But now the projects can be directly connected to SOLIDWORKS files and other related documents. Individual tasks like model creation, simulation, and testing can be assigned and detailed uh, progress can be tracked and viewed through dashboards and reports. Projects can be launched from customized templates to help you standardize and automate. SOLIDWORKS PDM workflows are fantastic, but they may not fit all your complex and growing needs. SOLIDWORKS managed processes are similar to workflows, but provide even more flexibility. You can run multiple processes at the same time on the same document. For example, several engineering changes may be in process while parallel simulation or cost studies are being performed. And another thing, SOLIDWORKS Manage process doesn't require files. It can run on its own, whether to track timesheets, employee training, or manufacturing problems, and its corrective actions. Best of all, SOLIDWORKS Manage connects directly to one or many of your PDM professional vaults. That means your project processes and bill of materials can utilize existing PDM data and can even act as a consolidation point if you have multiple vaults. With advanced bills of materials, connected project management, and advanced processes, SOLIDWORKS Manage tames your data complexity so you can spend more time designing and manufacturing great products. Consider what SOLIDWORKS Manage can mean to your business and check out our other videos to explore additional capabilities of SOLIDWORKS Manage. 
era of additive manufacturing is officially here and is enabling designers and engineers to produce parts that would have previously given any machinist nightmares. The geometric freedom offered by additive manufacturing can easily lead to complex shapes whose behavior is difficult to predict with spreadsheets and hand calculations. On top of this, the fact that additive manufacturing is still largely done with plastics further increases the complexity for designers who need to ensure reliable performance of their designs. SOLIDWORKS Simulation is not only ready to tackle these challenging validation scenarios, it can also help designers convert their easy-to-model prismatic parts into organic shapes best suited to additive manufacturing. Introduced in 2018 and enhanced in 2019, Topology Study is an exceptional tool when designing for additive manufacturing. This generative design study type is available to SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional and Premium users and is drop-in compatible with designers' existing habits and practices. Parts are modeled as usual using standard cuts, bosses, or even surfacing if you're feeling adventurous. After generating the base shape of the part, a linear static study can be run to confirm that the design will perform as intended. Does this process look similar to what you're doing today? Perfect, because with only a couple more steps, we can optimize this part for additive manufacturing and validate the new geometry. Our static setup can then easily be copied into the new topology study. And then by adding a couple of goals and constraints, we are ready to optimize our part. It should be noted that topology study assumes linear behavior. So it is worth using the factor of safety constraint introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2019 to compensate for this assumption. With the analysis complete, SOLIDWORKS presents us with a plot of the required geometry for our given specifications. We can choose just how minimalist we want this geometry to be with the built-in slider, which updates our plot on the fly. Simulation 2019 also allows us to export this geometry as a smooth mesh in a new configuration, part, or body. Whether you want to minimize weight, save material, or simply produce a cooler looking part than your competitor, Topology Study will help you get there. So what about that factor of safety we use to compensate for our non-linear assumption? While we could do physical testing to determine this or overestimate to stay conservative, these options undermine the goals of reducing costs and optimizing the design. Instead, we can leverage the nonlinear solver in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium to validate the real-world behavior of our optimized geometry. The rich integration of my simulation studies, modeling environment, and topology results make it a breeze to perform some quick modeling to clean up the mesh around our connection locations. Copying the study setup from the original static study is as easy as dragging and dropping it onto the new nonlinear one and updating our connecting faces. This makes it easy to ensure that the setup I start with is the same one that I use with my final analysis. This streamlined workflow makes it easy to confirm the factor of safety, check the total displacement, and predict the performance of our part without spending time, material, or money on a prototype print. Neither material nor weight come for free, but SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium gives you the ability to confidently reduce both. Contact us today to take full control of your design and validation process. No 3D printer of your own? Javelin's print services have you covered so that you can start taking advantage of additive manufacturing right away. My name's Colin Murphy, and I'm an applications engineer with Javelin Technologies, and welcome to my backyard. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Javelin session today. My name's Alex, and I have had a chance to talk to quite a few of you. I, but if not, I am the strategic account manager for British Columbia and take care of all things SOLIDWORKS. So again, I appreciate you guys coming on board today. So we want to make the best use of your time. So we'll get kicked off uh, right away here. So to get into the agenda, we have the large assembly best practices and methods. We're then gonna get into the streamlined processes which will cover design to manufacture. We'll have a quick five minute break. We'll then get into the tips and tricks and productivity session. Then Claudia will give us a what's new in 2020 and the top enhancements. 
And then finally, we'll touch on trends in additive manufacturing, specifically plastics and metal. So just for a little background on Javelin, we are proudly Canadian and we're coast to coast. So we have eight offices in five different time zones across Canada to help serve you better. And essentially what that means to you is it's pretty much 14 hours of technical support per day. So if we file a ticket at the end of the day Pacific time, there will be someone awake three or four hours before us and hopefully have an answer waiting for you in the morning here. In terms of software solutions, we are primarily a CAD reseller, but there's a lot of add-ons on top of SOLIDWORKS as well, which you may or may not be familiar with. For example, we take care of DriveWorks and uh, Delmia Works as well. So the SOLIDWORKS product portfolio is constantly expanding. And if it's SOLIDWORKS related, we'll be able to help you with that, or at least provide some great recommendations on who to get in touch with. On the hardware side, uh, we have a really great lineup of 3D printers. We're proudly a Stratasys reseller, and that's been our bread and butter for some time, but we're really excited to be getting into the metal space over the past couple of years with desktop metal and exact metal. And we also have some top of the line scanners as well. For example, the Artec 3D brand scanners. Another thing that we're really happy to introduce for some time now is a print and scan services. So not everyone's gonna be at that point where they're ready to make the investments into a full 3D printer. And we totally understand that. So if you just need a one-off part or a small run of parts printed off, we could take care of that with our part services bureau. And the same can be said for scanning. If you just have a one-off use case, then our team can help uh, provide those services here. And lastly, uh, bef a couple more things here before we pass it along. So it, times, times are a little trying right now, clearly, for quite a few companies uh, with, with COVID. So we want to make sure that we're help supporting you as best as possible. A lot of our customers are moving into a strictly remote setup for the first time, and we're helping smooth that transition. So couldn't recommend enough taking advantage of our support line. Our people are really skilled and, and really keen to help. Uh, another thing that you could do if there's less urgent or if you're just looking to um, catch up on general knowledge, our blog is actually one of the top SOLIDWORKS related blogs in the world. We're really proud of that. So if you haven't had a chance to do so, please go check out our blog as well. And related to COVID, just just on the bright side, some, some silver lining here, we've actually heard a lot of really positive stories as well too. Um, in times like this, we're seeing a lot of people come together and, and just donate their, their time or, or resources or whatever it is. So we're leveraging our secure manufacturing facility to help create uh, personal protection equipment for medical workers, specifically mask. So we're working with the Sunnybrook Research Institute with that. So we're happy to make some type of contribution. And we know a lot of our customers are doing the same. So with the presentations today, we're going to have some, some prizes. So you could win one of two space mice. They're really cool. I hear there's a little bit of a an adjustment period to get used to them, but once you get used to them, they're they're fantastic and will speed up quite a bit. Our grand prize is a thousand dollar three D printing services voucher and an AMD Radeon Pro graphics card. So what we're gonna do at the end of the session is we're gonna send you out a survey link, and half an hour after the end of the session, we're gonna draw prizes. So we definitely recommend that you wait until the, the end of the full presentation is completed to give your feedback because there's going to be some feedback based on, off the end as well. Um, so again, just back into the agenda here. So we're going to get started with the large assemblies, best practices in model. So I'm going to pass it along to Colin Murphy to start delivering that content. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Alex. Uh, yeah, like Alex said, my name is Colin Murphy, and I am an applications engineer here at Javelin Technologies. 
And part of my job is visiting our customers and asking them, you know, what's slowing them down? What are, what are areas where we can help them become faster or more efficient? And one of the most common things that I hear is that they're experiencing trouble when they're working with large assemblies. And this large assembly uh, description can really mean a lot of different things. But I've compiled a list here of, of really what the top items are that uh, the SOLIDWORKS power users will say to me when I visit them. So one that I hear is really common, you know, they get into the office in the morning, they open up their assembly and they leave and go get a coffee waiting for their assembly to open. Or maybe they think that they are applying best practices, but SOLIDWORKS assemblies, you know, they're just slow. It's just the nature of the beast when we get a lot of components or complex geometry. Uh, maybe they are working with that complex imported geometry and we'll get a little bit more into that later. Or they're downloading third-party components from suppliers' websites, you know, parts uh, from McMaster Car, for instance, that offers SOLIDWORKS components. Also, maybe they're working with components in many different configurations, right? These are kind of the top, top things that, uh, that they'll raise their hand to when I, do, when I do ask them about their large assembly problems. So, you know, maybe you're seeing something on there that strikes a chord with you as well. Now, when I speak to managers, they're not the ones who are typically going to be in that software every day. So they give me a different set of indicators that their team might be having large assembly slowdowns. So some of the things that they say, Maybe they dread design review meetings because they're just waiting for the files to open and they think it's a waste of their time. Maybe they're, they're questioning the return on investment that they've made in the CAD software. You know, why are my engineers sitting around waiting for their assemblies to open? Uh, or maybe they just think that's normal. That's just part of the process, despite the training that their, uh, their employees have taken. So what I would like to do is, is to take a very shallow dive into the area of large assembly management. So this is a very um, widespread problem, which means there are lots of different ways to diagnose and to help with large assemblies. And I certainly don't have all the time to go through all of them today, uh, but we're going to start out just with some large assembly best practices. So one thing that I hear a lot from people is, how do I stop my SOLIDWORKS from crashing when I'm working in assemblies? Uh, I haven't quite had anyone get to the keyboard smashing stage yet, uh, certainly not that I've seen, but uh, some ways that we can help with these issues. Firstly, we want to make sure we're optimizing our software setup. So there's a few key settings uh, which are listed there, which I'll get into a little bit more detail of um, shortly. Also, we'd like to ideally avoid large assemblies, which kind of seems like a no-brainer uh, when we're working with large assemblies. We want to avoid them, and that will prevent the problem. But I mean something very specific there, and I will touch on that later as well. Also, we'd like to use display states to hide and show our components. I see it all too frequently that uh, you know individuals are using configurations to hide and show components. This is really going to slow down your assembly when we can use display states to accomplish the exact same thing. Also, at our uh, top level assembly and in our sub assemblies, we want to lock degrees of freedom where possible. So if we can have our components all fully constrained in space, uh, with all six degrees of freedom restricted, that's really going to help our performance. You know, one of the most common ones is probably toolbox fasteners that are left free to rotate. Uh, luckily, in 2019, there was a really nice enhancement that allows you to lock all of these after insertion, or have them the the, the rotation of them lock when you're actually inserting these fasteners as well. So for our software setup, first we're going to look at a couple of system options. So the arrows, the first two arrows that we have there, they are pointing to our high quality transparency. In general, we can just turn this off. We probably won't notice much of a difference in how our part is appearing, but it's certainly going to help with our performance. And that slider there, that third arrow that you see, that is our curvature generation. So this is specifying the level of detail during dynamic movements of our model. So things like rotating, panning, or zooming. And when you're doing that, if you notice the model becoming blocky, that's because of the curvature generation slider that you see there. Now that, you know, there, there's, a, there's a happy level there where we're gonna be seeing an increase in performance, but not uh, enough degradation that it really bothers us when we're rotating our model. The next settings are a document property, which means these are stored in our part and assembly templates. Uh, and they have to do with our image quality. So image quality controls how many graphics triangles we see on the screen. When SOLIDWORKS generates the images of our model, uh, it does this by breaking the model up into little triangles. So the more of these we have, the smoother those curves are going to look, the less, the more blocky or octagonal those uh, curves are going to look. Uh, the top slider there, that controls the tessellation of curved surfaces for uh, shaded models. So this is you know, when we're looking at our part or our assembly. This is how we're, uh, we're tessellating that model. Um, the further to the right, 
the more graphics triangles, triangles we have. So I mentioned downloading parts from a uh, supplier's website like McMaster Car. Their parts by default are set almost into the red. So that's, uh, that's significant. Um, and the, the second slider there is controlling the image quality of our model edges in drawings. So some negative impacts to having this, sli the, this slider all the way to the right. Firstly, larger file sizes. And this is actually an exponential increase. Uh, once we get close to that red, we'll see the file size actually take off um, exponentially. We'll also notice longer opening times, mostly due to graphics regeneration times. So if we're generating more triangles, that's gonna take more time and it's gonna put more, more of a burden on our system. Also, we'll notice more increased lag during operations. So moving the model, rotating the model, uh, we're gonna see slowdowns there if we do have large values for our image quality setting. Now, our recommendation here is uh, to have all of our part and assembly templates set to an image quality setting of approximately 10%. Between 10 and 15 percent is, is usually okay. We recommend 10. Um, and if this is set in your part and assembly templates, then every time that we start a new part, it's going to be made with this image quality setting. Uh, the default is around 50 percent, just as an FYI. Um, and also, when we import any uh, any you know neutral files like a step file, for instance, it's also going to be using the same image quality setting. So uh, I would encourage you to make sure that your part and assembly templates have a lower image quality setting uh, set to around 10%. Now, I mentioned earlier, we want to avoid large assemblies. Uh, this uh, screen that you see here is, uh, this is Treehouse, which is installed when you install SOLIDWORKS on your system. You may not even know it's there, but it probably is. Uh, and it shows us the breakdown of our assembly or the assembly structure. So how many components do we have at the top level of our assembly? How many sub-assemblies are we using? That kind of thing. Now. Uh, it may be uh, common for you to have most of your components located at the top level assembly uh, level. So no sub assemblies. Um, in general, it's gonna be best practice to co construct our assemblies with as many sub assemblies as possible, which can either be done by creating those sub assemblies individually and then inserting them. Uh, or if we already have all these components at our top level, I certainly understand that it's not always possible um, to break them down into sub-assemblies until we're done our design. Um, we can do this, where we can actually select one or multiple parts from our tree, uh, right-click on them, click Form New Sub-Assembly, and that's going to give us a new virtual sub-assembly within our main assembly. And then we can take that and save it out as an assembly file uh, on our, on our uh, system or, or in PDM. Uh, we do want to be careful when we're moving components in this way. Um, just we want all of the reference components that are referenced via mates, patterns, or uh, external references. There's a chance they'll be broken when we do this unless all of the associated parts are brought with it. So please just keep that in mind. Some other best practices, we want to work locally. So, uh, you know, one of the easy tests to do for our large assemblies is to open it off the network, time it, uh, and then, you know, restart our system, restart SolidWorks, Make sure we have a pack and go of that assembly, bring all the files local onto our C drive, and then open it again. And usually we're gonna see a reduction in file time working locally, which makes sense. Uh, this certainly isn't always, it, it, it certainly isn't always easy to do this, especially if we're collaborating or using library components that we don't wanna duplicate. But luckily, SolidWorks PDM is going to create a local copy of your files for exactly this reason. So we have a database where we sync all of our changes to, but we're able to work locally on our system uh, to get the, the performance that we would experience from working off of our C drive. We also wanna make sure that all of our files are up to date. So if we're working in SOLIDWORKS 2019, for instance, and we're using library components that were made in SOLIDWORKS 2008 or 12 or 15, when those older files are opened, there's essentially a conversion running in the background there that, to open those files. So they're gonna rebuild and they're gonna open slower. So if we can update all of our files, then we should certainly do that. Uh, unnecessary details, we can get rid of those. So things like, you know, if we're downloading screws from McMaster Car, for instance, they're gonna have all of their physical threads modeled. We don't always need that, right? A lot of the times a cosmetic thread is gonna suffice uh, unless we're, you know, running a, a simulation study on our thread or we're 3D printing something. Most of the time we can get rid of those threads. Also things like extruded or cut text, you know, if we can get rid of that information, it's gonna really clean up the number of triangles that we need to generate. Also, we wanna make sure we have a supported graphics card and that we're using the most recently uh, tested driver. So this uh, information can be found on the SOLIDWORKS website. We can also use it or uh, find it through the diagnostics tab in our RX tool. 
Um, but you know, when we're going between service packs and certainly between major releases, we want to make sure we're using the, the most up-to-date certified driver for our supported graphics card. Also, that RX tool can be used to clean up temporary files that are found in our system. So if we have, yeah, you know, once a month is, is probably a good rule of thumb to go in and use that RX tool to regularly clean up our system. So those are some best practices, uh, just a few uh, in the time that I have to, uh, to share with you. What I'd like to discuss next is imported geometry. So I hear, uh, I, you know, it's not very many people that I visit who aren't using some sort of imported geometry, you know, maybe something like this one. Uh, and this file is a step file that, you know, let's say we received it from a supplier and we want to take this uh, electrical box, mount it on our frame, maybe use it in some renders, but mostly we want to see our, our whole alignment, make sure that we have clearance for everything uh, and that we can connect up to all those fittings on the side. So this file on its own, it doesn't necessarily look bad or, or, problem, or problematic, but uh, there's a lot more that's going on behind the scenes here with this step file than we can actually uh, see. So this step file was imported as a multi-body part file, okay? uh, and then it was simplified by me. And the simplified version is the one on the right. Now, can we see a big difference? Certainly, visually, we can see a difference in the colors, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But first, I'd like to evaluate some properties for the one on the left. So this is the initial one that we got from our uh, from our supplier. So when we look at the file size, we're over 120,000 kilobytes, which is massive. Um, you know, you may think, well, that's the file that we get. That's the step file. So, you know, it is what it is. We can't really do much with that. Um, we, we certainly want to uh, because that file size is quite large. Uh, so we'll discuss that in a bit more detail later. Also, the appearances, and this is the kind of shocking one, I would say, is that we have 9,600 appearances on this part, on this uh, multi-body part file. Now, the reason for this is that when SOLIDWORKS imports a model, it's actually applying a different appearance to each face as it constructs that file. Now, this would be like me, you know, buying a can of paint to paint one wall in my house and then buying a new can of paint each subsequent time I wanted to paint an additional wall. Uh, that's a lot of drives to the paint store. I remember when I could drive to the paint store, but uh, that process is going to be really, really slow. It's going to um, it's going to take time, and that's basically what's happening in the background, minus the drive to the paint store, when SolidWorks is opening up this file. In terms of the number of solid bodies or surface bodies, we have almost nine thousand combined bodies here. That is a lot of unnecessary information. You know, sometimes maybe most of these are going to be necessary. In this case, a lot of that information is actually located on the inside of this cabinet. And our supplier just sends us the file. They just file save as, save it as a step file and send it to us. Um, so that's a lot of body data that we have here locked up in this part file. In terms of the last four, our graphics triangles, this was imported with an image quality setting of 10%, uh, but it still has 1.2 million graphics triangles just because of the complexity of those components. Uh, also, uh, for the last three, what I did, I took this part and I inserted it into an assembly all on its own. So just one part file inside of that assembly. Uh, and then I opened it and, and uh, measured some, uh, some opening times. Now in SOLIDWORKS 2018, there's actually a really nice enhancement to show us what stage of the open process we're at. Uh, the first step is the one on the left that's opening our body data. So that's the 9,000 bodies that we're, that we're gonna be opening. The next step is updating or rebuilding that assembly. So in this case, that took 16 seconds. And the last one is generating the graphics that you see on your screen once all that information is loaded. And to do that, it took about 20 seconds. So when we combined those three areas uh, to open up this assembly it took almost a minute, 56 seconds to open a one part assembly. Imagine if we had 40 pieces of imported geometry of similar complexity, that's, you know, that, that open time is gonna pretty significantly add up. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like inside of SOLIDWORKS. So you can see that when I click on a face, we're waiting before we have our menu pop up. We click and we wait. So just one part inside of this assembly, but it is painful to work with already. Um, if we want to rotate this file, you know, sometimes the rotating is going to work well, and other times we're going to notice a pretty significant lag before it snaps into place. So this already is pretty frustrating to work with. Uh, I can only imagine how, um, how heavy this file could become as we continue to add information into it. So, 
If we go back, we'll take a look at what we were able to accomplish from the file on the left over to the file on the right. So the first one is the file size. So we went from 123,000 kilobytes to under 10,000. So that's like a 92% reduction in our file size, which is awesome. Uh, we want to keep that file as light as possible. Um, and we were able to do that. In terms of the number of appearances, we're down to just one. That's why it all looks gray. Uh, we could always add more appearances in when we, uh, or, or um, uh, as we wanted to, you know, if we want our, our warning stickers to be yellow, perhaps. Uh, but we're down to just one appearance. And the number of solid and surface bodies was reduced to 49 total. So we were able to clean up a lot of that information inside, and our model still looks the same um, from a geometry perspective. Now, I didn't adjust any slide, any of that image quality slider for our graphics triangles, but we were still able to get the graphics triangles down to 105,000 just because of the reduction in body data. And when I inserted this component into an assembly all on its own, our open time went down to three seconds. So that is uh, <laughs> that is a remarkable improvement. Uh, that's you know when we put the a little bit of time up uh, in up front in order to simplify this it's going to pay off uh, once we open that file a couple times. So let's take a look at how this one on the right performs inside of our window. You can see there's no lag or delay between our selection and, and our menu pop-ups. Uh, rotating it is also really easy. That's really how it should be performing, in my mind, um, is without any, uh, any delay. So you might ask, well, how did you get from A to B? You know, you had that complex assembly. How did you get it to the simple or that complex part, excuse me, how did we get it to the simplified one? Well, the first step was removing all appearances. So this is actually really easy to do inside the part file. We're just going to right click on the name of the part file at the top of our feature manager tree. We're then going to look for our little appearance sphere with a pencil in front, click that drop down arrow next to it, and then select remove all part appearances. We'll wait for a couple seconds, and then all of the part appearances are going to be gone. That's pretty simple. Uh, now, the next question you might have is how did we go about reducing the body count from almost 9,000 to 49? Um, unfortunately here, I can't really give you a, an exact, here's how we did it. Because the way that we would recommend doing this is really dependent on what information is important for you to be kept within that file. Uh, I will say that in this, in this case, it took about 10 minutes, including the removing appearances in order to simplify this file. Um, and that's really where a partnership with Javelin can help, uh, where we can help you find the most streamlined process for you to get from that complex, annoying file to one that's simple and efficient with the information that is relevant for you. So that's a quick, uh, quick couple of things about imported geometry. Now I'd like to talk about large drawings. And if you have large assemblies and you're making drawings of them, I'm guessing you have large drawings. And the reason for this is pretty simple, actually. And that's because when we do open a drawing that references a large assembly, that assembly is being opened in the background to resolve all the views. That's how we're able to place new views or place things like section views, uh, is that we have the model open in the background. Uh, also, uh, all of our configurations inside our assembly file are gonna be rebuilt. So if we have tons of different configurations to just hide and show components, all of those need to be rebuilt individually and that's gonna take significant time. Another contributor to our problem are section views. And I'm not saying that we need to get rid of section views necessarily, but we need to be conscious of what's actually going on in the background. So when we do put a section view, SOLIDWORKS actually happens, has to open the model up in the background, add a section plane, and then push that information back to the drawing. So if we do have one assembly with 10 section views, it's kind of like we're opening up 10 assemblies in the background. So let's just be cautious of those section views. Um, I understand we can't get rid of them, and I'm not suggesting that we do. We just need to understand how they can contribute to the problem. So uh, for an example of a large drawing, uh, this drawing is relatively simple. It has about four sheets, four or five, I think, uh, but it references a very complicated assembly. There's a lot of data inside of that assembly, and the drawing file takes over five minutes to open. And if you're wondering how long the assembly takes to open, it takes over five minutes to open, um, which means if we just eliminate it from opening that assembly in the background, we'd be able to detail this drawing significantly faster. And luckily, in SOLIDWORKS 2020, we have a new open mode, which is called detailing mode. So this is going to allow us to open our large drawings super fast. 
if you're familiar at all with large design review mode, that can open our assemblies really fast because it's just loading the graphical data. Uh, detailing mode functions in a similar way where it's not loading that model in the background. It's just loading the actual drawing. So that one that we saw previously that took five plus minutes to open with detailing mode, it's going to open in a couple seconds. Um, so we just need to understand what we can and can't do while we're in detailing mode. So we can't add new views, for instance, because the, the model hasn't been loaded. So in order to do that, we need to load that model in the background. But we can add dimensions. We can modify our annotations or symbols. We can add sketch entities. We can even print out that drawing to a PDF DWG DXF file and certainly save any changes or annotations that we make. We can save those back to the file itself. So definitely a good option there for you to check out uh, in SOLIDWORKS 2020. Okay, sorry for the uh, glitch here, everyone. Hopefully we're back up and running. We had our, our guys working away on the back end. So, great. So I was told we're, we're up and running, so that's fantastic. So we'll just dive uh, right back into it here. So I was told, so I'll just go over the large assembly management here. So can't uh, stress enough to utilize those tips that Colin offered. Uh, large assembly is a really, really common requirement that people, customers are looking to improve upon because it's so much bread and brother, butter of design. Um, a lot of it can be improved with just optimizing your settings that you currently have with SOLIDWORKS. We also have the Javelin blog, which is a really great resource to uh, check out some of the large assembly management resources we have on there. If you're looking for something a little bit more tailored and more in depth, we also have our large assembly service, which we always, we really get great feedback on. So if you have a really rough situation in terms of uh, opening files, things like that, it just large assembly issues in general, we have essentially our Javan specialists take time to dive into your specific um, you know, data sets, your, your design philosophy, that type of thing, and give you suggestions on how to optimize it based off the large assembly. And then finally, if you're another really fantastic service we have is called our productivity service. And that's where uh, we, we, again, we have our expert dive into your company to get a really great understanding of how you guys are designing today. And then they'll take about 30 to 45 minutes with each individual user at your company and get an understanding of where those individuals are strong and where they could use some improvement as well. And then from there, we give you a customized training curriculum based on the feedback. So we really pride ourselves on the training consulting side of SOLIDWORKS, not just supplying you with the software. And these are some of the avenues we take to really um, to, to showcase that and help you out as much as possible. So to get back to the agenda here, we're going to go into the streamlined processes, the design to manufacture cycle, and I'm gonna pass it back to Colin. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Alex. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, what, so we, uh, we're here to talk about data management. And uh, in today's world, our data is really, really important. It's one of our most precious resources. And we have a lot of it. So whether this is our office documentation or our CAD data, or we need to be able to tame and structure this data uh, in a way to ensure that all of our information is being held securely, that it's protected, and that it's being utilized efficiently to help make our jobs and processes faster and more impactful. Um, this data management really is needed across all of our business sectors. So it's not just our engineering that needs this data for sure. Right? Maybe purchasing needs a bill of materials, manufacturing is going to need a drawing, maybe marketing is going to need access to the models to generate true-to-life renders with Visualize. Uh, what we need are business systems in place to ensure that this data can be shared effectively, right? So we're not attaching files to emails in order to send them through our company. So what we'd like to do is take a few minutes today to touch on solutions that we have here at Javelin to help secure, leverage, and enable that digital thread way of working. So we'll talk about four of them. The first one is PDM, that's on the top left there. The next one is Manage. We'll also discuss Eris, and Dell MiaWorks will be the final one. 
So we start with PDM. Now, this is typically the starting point for companies that are looking to manage their data. Uh, it is not just an engineering solution, though. It is a way to effectively manage and share all of your data types. So let's take a look. Uh, the root of this uh, is going to be a secured vault environment. So in order to gain access to this vault, each user is going to need a login and password. And that login is going to control what information they can and cannot see inside the vault. It's also going to control what they can and cannot do with that data while they're in there. Uh, now, within the vault, when I talk about data, we can manage well over 300 different file types. This is going to include SolidWorks, AutoCAD, Microsoft Office, PDF, emails, image files, uh, machining code. Uh, I honestly haven't found a, a file type yet that we cannot manage inside the vault. Um, and as of 2020, we also have connectors available that are uh, going to work with other native applications like Inventor, Solid Edge, and Pro-E. Now, all of this data inside the vault, it's going to sit in a workflow. And that is an example of a workflow. So that's a uh, relatively simple approval workflow with a uh, revision loop in it as well. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to uh, make sure that procedures within our company are being followed in terms of how documents are being approved, who's being notified at different steps, uh, and what they can do or what's being done when files are actually being approved. Um, we can, at any step through these workflows, we can, uh, we can automate various administrative tasks. So maybe when a drawing is approved, we want to create a PDF of that drawing and send it into you know, a file where a manufacturing manager is going to get notified, and he or she can then go and make sure the part gets made. Uh, we can also notify people. right? So that manufacturing manager is going to get an email to his or her inbox that is going to say, you know, here's a link to the files. We're ready to go. We can also control access to various files. So if you're concerned at all with the risk associated with manufacturing to the wrong revision of files, then we can just hide old revisions from uh, people who we don't want to be able to see them. Or maybe any files that are not in the approved state are invisible to certain people that are organizations. They can only see approved files. We can really, uh, we can really make sure that that's happening the way that we want it to with our workflows. Also, we want to make sure that our data is accessible. So in a very global economy, this means we want to make sure that, uh, that you know, whether it's you know, within this country or between different countries, we want to make sure that everyone at our organization is seeing the latest data while still maintaining that optimal performance I discussed in the first section of the presentation. We can also establish data connections to other databases. So, you know, if this is an ERP, for instance, we can push or pull information to or from this ERP, like project numbers, part numbers, uh, in order to, um, you know, help connect the system outside. So when we click on our vault in order to log in, we're prompted with this blue screen. So this is where we put in our secure login and password, which we'll go ahead and do right now. And once we are inside of this vault, we're going to be able to view all the information directly inside of Windows Explorer. So there's no need here to learn a new system. It's right inside of the interface that we're all already familiar with. Uh, we also have the option directly inside of Explorer to preview many different file formats. So whether these are Word documents, PDFs, images, maybe a PowerPoint we want to view. Also in Explorer, we have built-in e-drawings. So this is going to allow us to view and preview our CAD files, right? Maybe we want to take measurements off of our CAD files, for instance. We can also push information from here into the custom properties of our parts if we do have it set up in order to do it that way. Uh, so this, uh, this interface is really, really nice for design reviews, right? We're not reliant on an installation of SOLIDWORKS on this system in order to see the relevant data um, and actually interrogate our models. So the next step here is kicking off a new project. And what we're going to see is a top level project card, where we're going to want to put information in only one time. So if we do kick off a new project, then this card, which is fully customizable to take whatever information is relevant for you, uh, it's going to be filled out with a you know, project number, which can be generated automatically, uh, you know, project name, project leader, et cetera. And when we do that, it kicks off a lot of automation in terms of generating a file structure within a folder automatically. So we don't need to you know, have a different folder structure depending on the designer that we're working with. Everything can be standardized in this way. Also, you may have noticed that this document was created automatically.
Uh, and this information can be pushed elsewhere too. So it doesn't just have to go into our office documentation. This can go into the custom properties of our part files, for instance. It can go into the title block of DWG files. Uh, it really is up to us where we want this information to go. Okay, so here we have some files that we've just dragged and dropped into this folder. And as soon as we do that, they're going to inherit that top level project information. So that information can be pushed right into the title blocks. We can even do this in DWG or AutoCAD files. So if we're working in, a, you know, creating DWG files for electrical projects, that's not going to limit us. We can still put that information in where we want it. Now, when working with this um, add-in inside of SolidWorks, uh, we get an add-in right on the right side of our screen. So using this, we can very quickly view our entire assembly structure. And we can check out exactly what files we want write access to. So that's how we tell the system that we want write access to files is by checking them out. Um, so we can make some design changes to this. So we're also going to go and uh, open up this sprocket. If you notice on the right side of the screen there too, you can see exactly who has what open for write access. So there's no more questions about who has this file open. I'm mean, going to ask everyone to shut down their SOLIDWORKS. But here, when we open this and gain write access to it, we're going to start adding in some holes, for instance. And when we do this, we can check that file back in, and it's going to increment the version number by one. This is how we start to build up that design history as we work. So a couple uh, key benefits here. Firstly, uh, we have, you know, we can always go back to previous designs, right? If we have files that were made in, you know, many years ago, we want to see that design history, we always have that option too. Um, so here, you know, we have a few different, uh, few different versions inside of this file, and we can always go back and get any version that we want in order to see what it looked like. So maybe we're going to use this functionality for design reviews in order to see different iterations of a design. Maybe we come in one morning and our entire assembly is ketchup and mustard all over our screen. We have errors everywhere. Well, we can just go back to a previous version in order to access what it was like before. Uh, so a lot of really good benefits here to having this design history that's being built up as we work. And this add-in is going to be available in several applications, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, certainly SolidWorks, but also Microsoft Office, AutoCAD, DraftSite, uh, and Inventor, SolidEdge, and ProE, like I mentioned earlier, too. So now what we want to do is we want to get these changes approved. So we need to push these files through the next step in one of those workflows that I mentioned earlier. So we simply check the files in that syncs the changes we've made back to the database so everyone can see them. And then we submit them for approval. Now we'll pick exactly what files we want submitted for approval and also who we want to approve those files. Uh, and when we do that, that person is going to get a notification in their email inbox that will have not files attached, but links directly to those files inside of our vault. So uh, now we can see that they're waiting for approval. And when Jeremy, in this case, logs in, based on the email that he received, he can browse directly to those files and then approve them. Uh, this is where here he can put in additional comments or add in a, 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 you know, a secondary password. Uh, and those files are going to be approved. And this is where a lot of that automation is going to come in. So maybe file creation, right? If we're using our sheet metal, you know, if we're using sheet metal a lot, instead of having to manually go and create DXF files, we can actually automate the creation of those DXF files or PDF files, step files, maybe STL files for a 3D printer. Uh, in this case as well, our revision block has been populated automatically. So we're going to be bumped up to revision A, and we can put a signature on that revision or on that title block as well. Uh, so that we know who actually made this approval and when. So this is very much a quick snippet of PDM. So there is a lot more that it can do, uh, but all this functionality and more it can be implemented and customized for you in as little as five business days. So this is not a month long, you know, many, many month complicated um, implementation. It is something that Javelin is very familiar with, uh, and it, it really is one of the fastest solutions to get going with, which is why it's one of the quickest return on investments that we see for our customers. Uh, a really valuable add-on to a PDM system is the Web2 Viewer. So this is going to allow any device with an internet connection to connect to your PDM system remotely. And once you're connected, depending on the uh, permissions you have, 
in your login. Uh, you can view SOLIDWORKS and other data. You can upload new data, even make approvals. So definitely reach out to us at Javelin if you have more questions about this viewer. Another hot topic for us here at Javelin is the cloud, You know, especially with a lot of people working from home now. Uh, people are becoming more and more comfortable and accepting of maintaining their data in the cloud. Uh, so with this transition uh, of people's way of thinking, uh, we're really excited to announce that we've put a lot of thought and testing into bringing our clients the option of putting SOLIDWORKS PDM on the cloud. So we've done a lot of testing, leveraging cloud servers, and they've been very successful. So the goal of this here is to help eliminate the costs and frustrations of maintaining an in-house IT infrastructure. But again, please reach out to us for more information about this if you do have any more questions. And that concludes our first section on PDM and brings us to SOLIDWORKS Manage. So PDM is a fantastic tool to help us eliminate risk and get all of our files secure while also giving us a ton of automation. SOLIDWORKS Manage is gonna sit right on top of PDM to really extend its capabilities. So we're gonna be adding project management, extended bill of materials controls, uh, advanced process control, and as well combining all of this into real-time dashboarding and reporting to help visualize our data effectively. So like I said, it does integrate directly with PDM. So if we browse here in Explorer, uh, you know, we can see a lot of information about our assemblies inside of our PDM interface. So this might be our assembly breakdown or a, or a list or a bill of materials within that, that assembly file. But the data here is truly being connected from PDM to manage. We don't need to worry about where we navigate to it. So if we open up the record inside of SOLIDWORKS Manage, we'll see the exact same information coming from the same data source. So here we're not duplicating this data, we really are connecting it and integrating it with PDM. So we may need to add bill of material items, perhaps that we don't necessarily model. So these are commodity items, you know, things like Loctite or cable bundles. Uh, and adding them to our bill of materials is really easy. So we simply need to select the item that we want to add and the quantity of it that we want to add. And the result of this is that we're going to have a more complete bill of materials than we would see out of SOLIDWORKS. You know, we don't necessarily want to be modeling Loctite into our assemblies every time. Uh, we also have the ability to handle multiple bill of material variants within just one record. So this could be an engineering bomb and a manufacturing bomb, for instance, where you know the manufacturing bomb needs that Loctite in there, but the engineering bomb might not. Uh, we may also have different considerations for different locations that require different items or different suppliers. So you know, uh, shipping something in North America could be significantly different than shipping something over to Europe. So this is where we can compare and differentiate between those different bill of materials to see if there are any differences between them or any changes between them. We can even very quickly export this information to Excel, you know, to for a more friendly, uh, for, a, for a, you know, someone's not going into manage, they can still view this information effectively inside of Excel. For the project management, with, uh, excuse me, for the project management within SOLIDWORKS Manage, we're going to start from a fully customized project dashboard. And this is going to show us all of our active projects. It's going to show us our assigned resources, kind of what the status of all of those tasks are as well. We can even filter by project more specifically to get uh, valuable information regarding just that one project. So if we do click the project, we can see more details about things like project planning. Uh, what are our reference files for that project? You know, what are the deliverables required? Uh, we can even see more project specific, uh, project specific information that might be custom. You know, if we, you know, we may need certain forms or certain testing done for certain customers that aren't required for others. And we can see all that information here on a project uh, project by project basis. So if we want to kick off a project inside of Manage, we'll do this with our templated Gantt charts, and that'll help us keep track of stages, uh, resources, and our task assignment. It is a completely connected project management, which means we're linking all of these tasks directly with, with the files or information inside of PDM that it pertains to. We can visualize, the, visualize these tasks with a task board, which is more of a visual sticky note feel, and certainly we can customize this project view as much as we want to, to include things like schedule charts, network diagrams like this, uh, and even more. So the goal here is to give the, all the information that a project manager might need right at their fingertips while integrating directly with our PDM workflows. Another major pillar of manage is advanced process control. So perhaps an engineering change, for example. 
So here we have an engineering change dashboard, which again is fully customizable to what is relevant for you. Here we can see our critical ECRs, also maybe our approval or our close rate. If we want to sort this by you know, geography, uh, we can have that geographical information in there as well. And this is certainly not just limited to manage. So this can pull information from almost any data source to help combine and visualize the information in the way that we want it displayed. Before we push this change order along, we're going to need to add in affected items to make sure that all aspects and documents of our project are, are being captured. You know, whether these are, you know, renderings or composer files or related PDFs, it can usually be a pretty painful process to try to figure out all of the, you know, where used for all of these files and exactly where the references are coming from. With manage, luckily, it's just a few clicks. So here we can just do a quick search for a pedestal bearing and then very quickly find the related records to that part uh, and add them in. So no more kind of browsing and searching for all of the files that are required to be added into this ECR to make sure we have the relevant information. It's all gonna be right there when we want it. Also, we can add a few more pieces of information, you know, whether, like I mentioned, things like PDFs or a SOLIDWORKS composer file, and we can add these two items into this ECR as well. So this is really helping us ensure that our managed processes are controlling our PDM workflows in the way that we want them to, right? We really are integrating with that data and using manage, we're controlling those PDM workflows uh, directly. From here, manage is going to automatically kick off an engineering change process. So if we do open the ECO, we can see that all of that information is being linked in the way that we want it to. And now we just need to add some more information. So maybe we're selecting if it's a standard or an express change in our process. And if you forget what the heck that means, uh, well, that's where stage notes are gonna come in handy. So manage can have stage notes at every step of our process to help give guidance and make sure that we're ensuring, uh, make sure that we're following the proper procedures in the way that we want it to. So we'll fill out uh, a few more fields here and then we can move it on to the next stage. Once we have all of that relevant information included, uh, making a report for this engineering change is just a couple clicks away. Um, and we can really configure this to give us all of the information that we want it to, you know, including file format. Uh, but within that file as well, uh, you know, if we have barcoding requirements, we can add that in. We can include all the relevant information that we want to or have a space for engineering sign off. Um, it really is up to you how we how we can configure these reports. Okay, so that is a very quick look at manage. Uh, certainly a lot more that it can do, uh, but that is the, uh, the quick seven minute uh, intro to SOLIDWORKS Manage. And we'll move in now to talking about Eris. So Javelin has chosen Eris here as our, uh, our primary PLM solution for our customers. So kind of like Deso Systems has SOLIDWORKS, Eris really is a leader in its industry because of its longevity, its focus, how easy it is to use, and just being a you know, really proven solution for our customers. So historically, we've had a very limited set of options available when we were looking to address the demands of lifecycle management. In many cases, you know, people will just kind of keep doing things the way they've always done it, using very manual processes, you know, maybe printing out paper, attaching documents to email, but this is gonna be very error prone. It's certainly inefficient and it's really tough to grow uh, when, we're, when we're doing things in these ways with these type of processes. They're very hard to scale in a more global economy. So typically the only alternative to doing things this way has been to just buy a big PLM system from one of the major providers, uh, rip and replace the PDM environment that we have set up, migrate all of that data into our new system after a very complicated IT project, and then implement it and hope that all the people at the company are gonna use it. Uh, this process is very disruptful a lot of the time. It's going to introduce a lot of risk. It's also very expensive. But luckily, there's a better way, and that is extending our existing uh, SOLIDWORKS PDM system to get full PLM capabilities. We want to keep what works and then try to leverage that existing investment in order to uh, get better results with ARIS. Uh, so ARIS is a business-ready solution for product lifecycle management, or PLM. It's item-based and process-oriented, and it can talk directly to SOLIDWORKS PDM. It's also web-based, which makes it uh, very globally accessible, and it's very scalable for you know, corporate-wide implementations or multi-site implementations, and does have uh, enterprise-level security to help support you know, really strict compliance needs, things like ISO, for instance. 
Eris is geared to larger companies as it starts with a minimum of around 100 users. That is not cer that is certainly not just engineering. That's across our company, uh, but it is geared to those larger companies um, for sure. If you are a smaller organization that are looking for some of this functionality, there's a chance that Manage may be a good solution uh, since we can replicate a lot of this inside of Manage. Uh, but that's where definitely you want to reach out to us and we can have that discussion to try to find what the best solution is for you. And now we move on to our final section, which is Delmia Works. So Delmia Works is by no means a new product. It is just a rebranding of the widely adopted IQMS, which was acquired by Deso Systems last year. Um, so Deso is, is really, is really uh, putting a lot of time and effort into Delmia Works to make it an integral part of the SolidWorks platform. And it is truly an end-to-end -end solution. So it has your ERP needs, as well as a manufacturing execution system for fully automated production monitoring. Uh, the quality management system can cover those strict ISO or FDA standards. It has a supply chain management or SCM system that helps ensure constant and update, up to date information is moving up and down the complete supply chain. We know that the money really is being made on the shop floor, but in order to get there, our systems need to be in tune with one another and connected, which is a really big uh, aspect of that industry 4.0 way of thinking where we wanna leverage that data right from our design kickoff through to shipping it out the door. So not only is SolidWorks pushing information to the ERP, but the machines on the shop floor are also talking back to the system, giving a very high visibility on all, all aspects of that process. It is gonna start with the core setup modules. And from there, if we do need more capabilities, there are many more modules that can be added to the system. So the nice thing here is that because it is that single system, all the information is there, it's just a matter of turning on the capabilities when and where we need them. So we've already talked a little bit about the cloud uh, and how people are starting to warm up to this technology. Well, Domio Works is giving you all the options to choose from. It can be purchased perpetually with a yearly subscription uh, and it can be installed either locally or on the Deso cloud or on your own cloud environment as well. And so as you can see, there are a lot of options to help you secure and leverage your most valuable asset, which is your data. But I do have one more thing to share with you, which is the 3D Experience platform. Hello, I'm Charles. I'm a Dasso Systems Engineer. I work here doing stuff like this, and it's awesome. Today, I've got approximately two minutes to tell you about our 3D Experience platform and show you how it's amazing for your 3D projects. So let's get to the basics. What is the 3D Experience platform? Explanation, it's a platform that gives you access to a catalog of applications or apps, like the kids say these days. These apps allow you to design, simulate, inform, and collaborate on a project. Got it? Good. Let's imagine you want to build a hoverboard. There's going to be more than one person working on your project. For example, engineer, programmer, marketer, mechanical designer. Before, you used to work like this. No more, now that you can work on a 3D experience platform. Oh yeah, the platform looks like this. It's pretty cool. First things first, you need to create your personalized dashboard. It's your own pimped out working environment. Then you can invite your friends and colleagues to hang out. Kind of like a video game party. Here we go! Except it's for work. From there, you can finally begin your working journey using the most incredible toolbox ever created. <laughs> and inside, you won't find this, or this, or this, but rather multiple apps designed to help you collaborate on the project at hand. Every job position receives their own personalized package and therefore applications. For example, if you're an engineer, like this guy, you'll find all the apps you need to virtually simulate your hoverboard. And of course you'll have access to all the necessary collaborative applications that make it feel as if you're in the same room, without having to be in the same room. To resume, you can work on your project from anywhere on any device. Got it? Good. With the 3D experience, everything is stored on the cloud. Not this cloud, this cloud. Which means that you can never lose anything and anyone can access the latest version of a project at any time in total security. Which means you'll never have to listen to this sentence again. Yeah, which version is a good version? Is it master good good final or final master good? 
It also means that you can share what you want with who you want and keep what you want to keep private, well, private. Thanks to these project management tools, each individual can share their agendas and progress. And because Daso Systems is present in every industry, Shao, wonderful product. Where can I sign to invest? The 3D Experience platform is the solution you'll use for the rest of your career. So you might as well start using it now. Look at all the business opportunities it presents. Got it? Good. All right. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed that introduction to the 3D Experience platform here. Just going to quickly summarize uh, some of the points that Colin touched on. So we can't emphasize enough how valuable the the data is to your organizations we know that you know that as well the slide that always sticks out to me is that the volume of data doubles every year so it's just the lifeblood of of your company essentially and a lot of companies out there aren't taking advantage fully of the engineering data specifically the solidworks data and that's because they're worried about people externally in the organization outside the engineering group kind of you know, essentially messing something up, but with all these tools, you have really great security and really great control on who accesses the files and, and how much flexibility they have. Um, so if you're looking to collaborate and control files and projects, uh, you could use PDM or manage if you need a little bit more capability. Um, you could also configure and manage all your product information throughout its life cycle with Aris PLM. Or maybe you're just looking for better control on the business side of the manufacturing processes with the Mealworks ERP. Uh, so we could definitely help on all those points. That's a big. That's a big part of my role here at Javelin, especially having that data conversation. And we will get an understanding of how you guys are using your data today, and then make suggestions on improvements. Uh, also, if you guys have a single office, or if you need global access there's a lot of options on that as well too. So once you have that data collected, we can help you then share it out as well in, in a safe and secure way. Um, another resource we have, if you're already up and running with say like a PDM professional or something like that, and you wanna make better use out of it, we also have our data and process assessment service, which is again, one of our experts taking time to focus on your data specifically and give you recommendations and look for uh, any potential gaps and opportunities to improve on it. So that, that wraps up the first half. We're going to take a quick five-minute break. Uh, so we'll be back in five minutes and then kick off the second part of our presentation here. My name is Colin Murphy and I'm an applications engineer with Javelin Technologies and welcome to my backyard. Now I've had a lot of fun times hanging out back here with family and friends but a lot of the time, the conversation actually turns to be about these hooks. When we moved in, some of the hooks were facing this way, while others were facing this way instead. Now, which way is correct? I've heard a lot of strong opinions on either side of this debate, but one way has to be better than the others. Let's let the power of the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem settle the debate for us. Our goal is to test each orientation of the hanger, this way and this way, to see which way experiences less stress under an equal load. Step 1. We'll complete a full 3D scan of the hook in order to generate a mesh file that represents the hook's size and shape. Step 2. Using this mesh file, we'll use the power of Geomagic for SOLIDWORKS and SOLIDWORKS mesh tools to generate a fully featured SOLIDWORKS model. Step 3. We'll run a linear static stress analysis on each orientation of the hook using consistent fixtures and loading. Step 4. After determining the orientation that results in the least stress, we can flip all the hangers to be in that orientation and finally end the debate. We begin with Step 1, completing a 3D scan of the hook. To do this, we'll use the Artex Space Spider, this scanner takes pictures at over 7 frames per second to a 3D resolution of 0.1 millimeters, which should be perfect for our application. After completing multiple scans and fusing the results together, we are left with a mesh that can be exported in many different file formats. In this case, we'll export as an STL. Now that we have a mesh file of the hook, 
we move to step two, reverse engineering the scan. Geomagic for SOLIDWORKS is amazing for extracting surfaces and other information directly from the scan file. Since 2018, SOLIDWORKS has added great new functionality for extracting this information from the mesh as well. Combining these two tools and SOLIDWORKS surfacing and solid modeling, we're quickly able to create a highly accurate version of our part. Using this model, we're on to step three. This is where we can use a linear static simulation to evaluate our hook. We'll apply an appropriate material, fixtures, mesh refinement, and a five pound load applied to a small section near the end of the hook. We can copy this simulation to ensure identical material, fixtures, and mesh, and simply redefine our load to be in the opposite direction on the appropriate face. After running both studies, we're able to directly compare the results and see that when the hook is installed this way, the stress is noticeably less. So that's it. With the power of SOLIDWORKS, we were able to conclusively decide which way we should put these Mom, hooks. come here, please. My wife said she wanted them the other way. How do you know your designs will perform in the field? Maybe you use the experience and judgment of your engineers, or perhaps you perform hand calculations on any areas of concern. These traditional forms of design validation have, for the most part, worked for as long as engineers have been creating the world of tomorrow. However, as digital design practices have become commonplace, businesses both small and large have incorporated virtual simulation tools to simultaneously reduce their validation expenses while also improving the quality of their final designs. Best judgment and hand calculations can be very effective means of determining if a specific area of a part will fail from a specific load. Unfortunately, the limited scope of these methods simply does not allow engineers to gain broad enough insight into the overall performance of their designs, necessitating the use of multiple physical prototypes and large factors of safety. Simulation tools, such as SOLIDWORKS Simulation, allow engineers to apply many different conditions and loads to their designs concurrently, making it possible to test full designs against their actual operating conditions. The results of these simulations can be thoroughly interrogated to find any areas of concern, rather than needing to identify these areas before beginning the validation process. By incorporating nonlinear simulation, it is even possible to observe the failure mode of the design and any secondary failures that might occur. With tools all right, and we are back. So thanks for coming back and joining us again here for the part two of our session. So we'll, again, we'll dive right into it. Uh, before we get into the content, I do want to emphasize again, please, please call our support and let us know how we could help out with any changes you may or may have not had with uh, COVID-19. Um, there, we also have our blog that we definitely recommend that you subscribe to to get some really helpful tips and tricks here and there. Um, also, friendly reminder that we do have two space mice on a line, also a thousand dollars of 3D printing services voucher, and a graphics card. So definitely look forward to getting that survey feedback. Uh, at the end of this presentation here, and have it back or have it completed within half an hour because we're going to pick the winner half an hour once it's sent out. So we'll dive into the agenda and get into the tips and tricks session with Claudia Mack. Claudia, take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. Today we wanted to go over a few tips and tricks that we convey to our customers to assist them in making them as fast and efficient with SOLIDWORKS as possible. This is just a preview of some of the efficiency tools we convey to our customers in the advanced update and modeling courses. So start, starting with sketching and parts, let's take a look at some of the tricks to avoid some of the slowdowns and challenges that we see across multiple industries. We'll do this by modeling the bench shown here. So let's start by creating a new part and using our customizable in-context toolbar to quickly create a new sketch. 
Our gesture wheel can be easily customized for multiple environments, keeping our commands at our mouse. To allow us to focus on a design, utilizing the A key while in the rectangle tool helps quickly select the correct type for fast placement. We can create a midpoint rectangle with ease, which allows us to apply constraints simply by selecting a point instead of multiple entities. The auto insert dimension option allows for a quick application of dimensions to our sketch. And while placing a line, we can utilize the A key once more to quickly change from a line to an arc without the need to switch sketch tools. Another handy tip is using the Alt key while in the line tool to allow for quick selections to be activated and make it a breeze to define line options such as orientation. Now, most SOLIDWORKS users are very familiar with the Power Trim tool. It's a great way to trim unwanted areas from your sketch, but it's even more amazing that it can do things like move back in time if we trim something we didn't mean to, as well as ex uh, extending existing geometry using the Shift key. Now, although sketch contours are a great way to visually see if you have a closed loop, sometimes features like extrudes fail to create for various reasons. Utilizing the power of the Check Sketch tool allows SOLIDWORKS to do all the heavy lifting and quickly diagnose and highlight the issue to keep your design moving. In this case, we had overlapping sketch segments, which we commonly see when users import DWGs from other sources. Now we can quickly extrude this sketch to continue with our design. Another sketching method that is very popular is 3D sketching. It can save huge amounts of time by sketching in multiple axes at once. A great tip is to model your 3D sketch first, as we've done. Select an edge, use Control A to select all current edges, and convert the entities into a 3D sketch. This instantly creates 3D geometry linked to your solid model. And as of SOLIDWORKS 2017, can be easily mirrored right inside of the 3D sketch environment. For this design, we need some equally spaced points for later use, and the segment tool is perfect for this. This is a drastically underutilized tool that makes equidistant points with a single click and maintains the constraint even if a point is deleted. It even works on helixes and splines. Now we can delete the body and everything stays parametrically linked. So if we need to make any design changes later on, all of the geometry maintains the relations. Amazing, right? Our next tip has to do with weldments, more specifically structure systems. that are like weldments, but on steroids in a good way. Introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2019, it's a fast and easy way to handle all our weldment profiles in one feature. We can create all members by box selecting. No more groups after groups to get it all done. We can also quickly edit which members we want with a couple of clicks. Now what I'm showing is the creation of a welded frame, but remember that structure systems, despite the name, is a great tool for anything that has a constant cross section and creating custom profiles is a breeze. We also have the capability to use more than just line for members, giving us the flexibility of using points and planes to get the job done. If you wanna get fancy, you can even make use of helixes and splines. One of the biggest advantages to structure systems is that we can utilize multiple profiles inside of one feature. This would have taken multiple weldment features and trims to achieve traditionally. It's as simple as that. Secondary members can be easily added between existing members, in this case, utilizing our front plane to define the location. And of course, you can change the profile, pierce point, and alignment if you wish. For those of you who are seeing this for the first time, don't worry, we will take a more in-depth look in the what's new section to come. Once we are done creating our members, structure system automatically jumps us into our corner management tool. It is an easy way to set trim orders for simple and complex member intersections. We simply select the node and set the trim order in type. This gives us all the same control but without the need for additional features. 
Structure Systems really is a one-stop shop for weldment creation. When we are ready, we can mirror appropriate bodies to complete the design, just like with regular weldments. On top of that, we can even mirror whole structure systems, which you will see later in our What's New. Now let's finish off the bench. We'll start a sketch to create the seat. Reusing other sketch data, we can quickly right-click and select a chain of geometry, offset it to our desired size, and extrude it. Now we want to create some holes to secure it to the bench. And of course, the best way to do that is with the hole wizard. Many companies only use certain hole sizes that correspond with their inventory of fasteners. And this is where utilizing the hole wizard favorites makes things easy for new and veteran employees and takes the guesswork out of design. These favorites can also be shared from a central location to make sure everyone is working from the same list. Now we can use the same segment tool from earlier to quickly create equal hole spacings without the need to put them in one at a time. If you are using the same command multiple times as I am, make use of the pin at the top of the property manager to keep the tool active for continuous use. And now the bench is complete. When it comes to your sketching and part modeling efficiency, Javelin has you covered to help get through any challenges you may be facing with your design objectives. Now moving on to assemblies, we see a lot of our users twirling their assemblies around, trying to make parts together and struggle with parts from different sources. Let's take a look at some methods of dealing with these challenges. The first thing I want to do is mate this burner to the base of the unit but the face I want is not visible to me. Normally I might rotate my model or use select other, but there's a fast and easier way directly from the mate command. I can simply use the alt key to hide faces and get to the surface I'm looking for. This tip is definitely a game changer. Sometimes we need to deal with imported geometry from our suppliers or customers to either use or modify for our assembly. In this case, we have an imported burner and there's a fillet that we would like to modify for easier assembly and manufacturing. Utilizing the power of FeatureWorks, we can selectively recognize the fillet feature through our in-context toolbar and it becomes fully parametric. Note that this add-in needs to be activated and is included in all levels of SOLIDWORKS. In a couple of clicks, we can even change it to a chamfer and modify the size for easy machining and assembly. Inserting this into our assembly, I want to be able to mate it as easily as possible. And a great way to achieve this is the component preview window. This was a Javelin driven enhancement for SOLIDWORKS 2016 and is an incredibly powerful and quick way to get our components mated. We can access the component preview window from our in-context toolbar, and it's going to pop up a separate window that isolates the component and allows us to independently interrogate it. Now we can easily mate it in place without the need to rotate the entire assembly or using select other. Also, the quick mate context toolbar brings standard and even some advanced and mechanical mates right to your cursor for easy access. Now I've chosen to use a concentric mate and then a coincident mate to highlight that despite not being able to see my part in the assembly window, I was easily able to continue mating it. However, profile center mate is the most efficient to mate the two edges at once. For aligning the holes in the part, I can sync the windows and change the state of the preview part in the main assembly, in this case to hidden, to give me the maximum flexibility when using this tool. Note that these additional options were a SOLIDWORKS 2019 enhancement. The last approach we're going to look at is the peg and hole approach that we can apply by dragging our part or subassembly into our assembly window. We can open our part and by grabbing an edge and dragging it into our main assembly, SOLIDWORKS automatically looks for mates to apply. So what we'll see is that at our cursor, the peg and hole mate is being applied, 
which actually applies two mates at once. We can also flip our alignment by either hitting tab on our keyboard or after mating using breadcrumbs and right clicking the mate to flip. Now you may have noticed for this burner, we do not have any holes pre-drilled for alignment. In this case, we can utilize existing hole geometry on our burner to create the holes in the main base and even automatically add fastener stack ups. The tool we will use is called hole series and is an assembly level feature. If you don't know where to find this feature, pressing the W key activates the command search so you can avoid searching through menus and stay focused on your design. We can select existing holes to utilize and specify what surface to go up to. This will propagate the holes into the stove base at the part level. We can easily place fasteners and customize a stack up by changing the fastener type and adding washers and hex nuts. These will all auto size to the hole and are fully parametric. So if the holes or threads change, so does the corresponding fastener. Hole series can also be used for holes through multiple parts where pilot and clearance holes may be needed. These are just a few ways that we, can, that we can put our assemblies together faster and easier with SOLIDWORKS. The last section I would like to go over is drawings. We want to be able to get our documentation done as quickly and accurately as possible while adhering to company standards to get our design out the door. Let's take a look at some tricks for detailing. Before I even get to the drawing stage, I may want to change my assembly structure to match my manufacturing process. Let's see how we can do this by navigating to our feature tree and using a quick shift C to minimize our tree. We can grab parts and sub assemblies that may need to be put together into an additional assembly and simply right click and create sub assembly. The ex in the, the existing mates between parts stay intact and will be found in the mate folder of the sub assembly. In this case, the base, lid, and mounting components will be assembled first, and I want that to be ref reflected in my assembly. This new subassembly can now be detailed separately and have its own bill of materials. The next thing I want to do is make sure my views are correct. But what do I do if my front view isn't my front or my Z axis isn't the right correct orientation? This often happens with imported geometry. So to correct this, I'll orient my assembly, and then using the space bar, I can quickly pop up my view selector and use the update standard views option to set my views in the correct orientation. This update instantly updates all my views. Much better. This will streamline detailing. So when I go to start a new drawing, we'll see that all of our views in the view palette have updated and are ready for use. Now, as we know, we can quickly drag them in and I can hold control during placement of, for say, the projected view to, um, to break alignment, like for the isometric view. Now, utilizing our customizable in context toolbar, we can quickly create a bomb for this assembly and set its properties. In this case, we will use an indented bomb make sure all our text is uppercase as per our company standards and place it in our drawing. We can see the subassembly structure we created before is reflected in the numbering and adjust any columns as needed. Now, if our table is misaligned with our drawing template, we could utilize anchor points or simply use the Alt key to click anywhere in our table and drag it into position quickly. This also applies to drawing views. So for large or overlapping drawing views, we can reposition them easily instead of finding the boundary of the view. Once again, our in-context toolbar comes in handy so that we can quickly leverage the auto balloon tool. And now our drawing is complete. We want to make sure you are getting your designs to the shop floor as quickly as possible and mastering the detailing process is a great way to achieve that goal. 
Thank you very much for that, Claudia. Those are some great tips there. A really helpful one is the reusing whole wizard data. That one comes up quite a bit. Um, so these tips and tricks sessions are really crucial to make sure that you're getting the most out of your subscription. So with SolidWorks, there's five service packs per year in terms of upgrades and one major release per year. Um, so that means on average is about 200 to 250 new features and functionality uh, improvements. So part of what Angus and I do is give you and your team these complimentary tips and tricks sessions. We recommend to do them um, right after you guys have upgraded from one major release to the other. And we take the time to to take out the most relevant functionality improvements for your team based off what you're working on and then present those to you. Um, so again, really, really important to take advantage of all the SolidWorks capability because there could be one tip that saves you two hours a week and that just stacks up over time to, the, to make a huge difference really. Our blog is always a really great resource too. Um, if you just need some quick tips and tricks, uh, that's, that's a, a, again, another great resource. So we will now go into the what's new in 2020 and cover the top enhancements here. So I'm going to pass it back to Claudia Mack. Thanks. So every year, SolidWorks adds over 250 changes to software. And let's take a look at a few of the highlights from 2020. So first, we have improvements to the fillet tool. Changes are a natural part of the design process, as we know. And in this example, a single boss extrude command was used to create the solid. And although that's efficient, we found out that the cutout on this part needs to be a separate feature to support multiple configurations in the assembly. Now this change is easy as we can use our rollback bar and contours of the existing sketch to create features required for this change. With SOLIDWORKS, changes like this are simple. And what we will see is, and as we expect, the mounting holes will update automatically. However, the fillets fail. The edge references have changed, even though the geometry is, is identical to the original design. A new streamlined workflow in SOLIDWORKS 2020 will now automatically repair these missing fillet edges. So now that picked up all of those edges, that's no longer a manual work, and now we don't have any more catch up on our feature tree and our design is complete. This speeds up the design change process and keeps us focused on our designs. Next, we have this design for an abrasive water jet. Subassemblies are used to represent the multiple mechanisms and linkages. These assemblies are made flexible so the mechanical motion can be evaluated at the top level. To finish this design and protect the moving parts from the abrasive material, O-rings and bellows are put in place. But how do you make them flexible so that they properly connect to the rest of the assembly? With SOLIDWORKS 2020, this task is dramatically simplified. The new Make Part Flexible tool allows us to remap the external reference of the part with ease. So in this case, the 3D path of the bellows references the cylindrical face of the pivot ball housing. After clicking OK, the geometry updates and continues to update automatically after every assembly movement. This process is repeated for the other instance of the bellows part without creating unique configurations or separate part files. This optimizes your data management and efficiently brings parts to life. Whether it be living hinges, bellows, springs, cables, and beyond, the new Make Part Flexible with SOLIDWORKS 2020 improves how you visualize and validate your next assembly. SOLIDWORKS 2020 removes also a lot of frustration when offsetting surfaces. So this cover design here needs more clearance for internal components. And the offset surface tool will work here. So in SOLIDWORKS 2020, 
Faces that can't be offset the desired amount are now automatically identified and highlighted in the tree. You can view and remove the failing faces to build the remaining geometry all at once. This streamlined workflow simplifies the process of creating offset surfaces, saving you time when creating complex geometry. No more troubleshooting individual faces to complete your design. From here, SolidWorks' powerful surfacing tools make it easy to clean up the remaining surfaces and create design that can be injection molded. To finish the design, we can use a surface thicken to create a constant wall thickness part. New in SolidWorks 2020, you now have the option to thicken the surface equally in both directions, giving you more options to simplify part modeling. Our finished design looks great, meets our design requirements, and is ready to be manufactured. Now you can feel confident when working with imported surface data or offsetting existing geometry. We see a lot, an increasing number of our customers detailing every component in their CAD models for more robust bombs and designs. Assembly patterns provide an efficient way to add multiple copies of components to your assemblies. SolidWorks 2020 introduces new enhancements to these productivity features. We want to quickly complete the detailed design of this rail assembly so that we can get it out to manufacturing as soon as possible. Pattern-driven component patterns are powerful, allowing you to leverage part-level features to drive the placement of components at the assembly level. Now, they're even more intelligent in that they understand the orientation of whole wizard features that are created with 3D sketches on multiple faces. This means a single pattern can now be used to copy the associated fasteners without the need to skip instances or use multiple patterns. That was easy. Often, our designs need to accommodate the needs of other design teams, suppliers, or cu our customers. Linear and circular component patterns are now more flexible by allowing you to modify each component instance within the pattern. This includes the ability to change the angle of individual instances within circular patterns or the distance within linear patterns. In this case, we have a set of holes, but due to clearance issues, two of them are not equally spaced. This becomes obvious as I start adding more components, but this no longer requires multiple patterns to insert the remaining fasteners. In this circular pattern, you simply adjust the angle of desired components, giving you the ultimate flexibility when you have irregular patterns where non-uniform spacing is required. All done. Well, almost. Finally, to complete the design, we'll mirror this subassembly by the right plane. I easily accessed this command using the S key, which opened up my customized toolbar. In the command, the option to change the orientation is now easier to understand with quick access buttons within the property manager. Sometimes the option to use the center of bounding box or the center of mass do not provide the desired results, as we can see here. The new option to use component origins makes the mirror component command more robust for parts that are not symmetric within the previous two cases. And now we're all done. Assembly patterns are now easier to create, more flexible in their control, and more intelligent in their execution in SOLIDWORKS 2020. Structure Systems was introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2019 and provides a more flexible method to create welded structures with or without the use of complex 3D sketches to define all members. As promised, Let's review some of the capabilities of structure systems and take a look at several of the enhancements for SOLIDWORKS 2020. In this example, the weldment was created with just a couple of sketches, an axis, and four planes. 
primary members can be ad created in a variety of ways, but now in SOLIDWORKS 2020, the point and length member definitions have new options. Members can now be created between a pair of, of sketch points or chained together to create a series of members along a chain of points. The new up to point option allows you to create members that all converge at a single reference point. And the new up to plane option creates members that terminate at a selected plane. The members extrude in the direction of the reference plane, or you could choose a sketch segment as a direction to define the members. As introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2019, secondary members can now be added using support planes, and for these, a different weldment profile will be used. The top of these members need to align with the selected planes, and to accomplish this, an alternate pierce point can be selected. Another secondary point can be added using the between points method, and we'll define this member to go between the corners. In SOLIDWORKS 2020, primary and secondary members can now be split during creation. Splitting can be done using dimensions, instant counts, or by selecting a reference such as a plane, face, or structural member, like in this case. And for this member, we'll rotate the profile by 90 degrees. When you are finished defining the structure system, the corner management tool kicks in and allows you to define the corner trims. For the simple corners, we'll, de defi we'll define the a planar trim with full contact to the intersecting member. For the complex corners, SOLIDWORKS does a fantastic job of determining the trim tool as well as the trim order for the intersecting members. Hiding the vertical member, you can see what a great job SOLIDWORKS did on the corner management. Now to create the circular structure that you was shown at the beginning of this demonstration, we need to pattern the structure system. Previously, bodies could be patterned to achieve this, but now in SOLIDWORKS 2020, you can create linear circular patterns or mirror the entire structure system. Now, by patterning the structure system itself, you're maintaining the intelligence of each of the members and additional structure systems can be added, referencing the patterned members. This was not possible when patterning bodies. In this example, we're adding a new structure system to define the perimeter members. These are added between the original structure system and its patterned members, and the pierce point can be defined to align to the planes. Upon exit of this structure system, the corner management tool determines the corners between the new members of the first structure system and its patterned members. This perimeter structure system can also be patterned to complete the design. This large structure system, this large structure that could, would have taken many groups and features to complete with traditional weldments was very quick and simple using structure systems. The structure system feature introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2019 and enhanced in 2020 provides an advanced weldment environment that lets you create and modify structural members of different profiles in a single feature with flexible corner management and trimming. Now, a few simulation highlights. Instead of having all of our parts meshed in either draft or high quality elements, now with SOLIDWORKS 2020, we can mix them. This ensures that our mesh has detail where we need it and can run faster where less detail is required. Our simulation feature can get quite long, but now we can use a quick shift C to collapse the entire tree. Finally, the new simulation evaluator provides a quick sanity check to ensure an optimal setup for successful simulation, checking things like storage capacity, materials, and mesh volume. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. So that wraps up SOLIDWORKS 2020. And in a nutshell, it wants to help you to design faster. So the big focus of it is being able to design more complex products without needing to navigate so much in individual complex features or processes. Um, so just some quick advice. 
the big thing that we see commonly is people installing to 2019 or, or 2020 and still using SOLIDWORKS like they're using 2017. So again, can't stress enough to leverage us for those free what's new sessions. Um, they're really, really valuable. If let's say you're on SOLIDWORKS 2017 or, or 2016, you're thinking about um, upgrading a few years, then it could be a good opportunity to do advanced update training because at that point, there's a lot of material to cover in just a couple of years, which is a paid service that Javelin offers as well. And um, yeah, typically we do that online. So that leads us to the trends in additive manufacturing around plastics to metal with uh, Jean Simone. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for still being with us. So we'll do the next segment with you talking about uh, additive manufacturing. So I will try to share with you some trends and also uh, hopefully share some ideas and potential application for uh, your organization. So before uh, we started, before we start, uh, maybe just a short story. So as uh, a lot of you know, Javelin has been forever in uh, 3D uh, design, uh, but some of you might also have seen uh, the name Symmetrix before. So J Javelin and Symmetrix decided to, to form one powerhouse that combined for now 50, uh, 55 years and more than that, uh, deserving uh, organization across Canada. So if I go back to additive manufacturing, uh, with, uh, with Symmetric and the Additive Manufacturing Division uh, in Javelin. Uh, we are helping more than 2,000 organizations across uh, Canada. So we're talking about over 30 years of combined additive experience. And uh, we, we, we really try to focus on finding innovative applications of technology to drive uh, the development of new capabilities. So how do we help our clients? Um, for, for us, it's pretty simple. So we, we are helping our clients by becoming partner with them. So we are partnering with innovation leaders to adopt 3D printing with years of experience to custom tailor solution that, fix, that fits a unique application. So we are able to support our clients and organization with different kind of hardware. So for example, we are offering more than 20 different printers from, a, uh, from the 12K to half a million dollars US depending on the application and solution. We are also able to support our clients with different software that are, that are powerful, but also easy to use. And also by support with our expertise that helps our customer to uh, transform their business. So just to name you a, a few of our suppliers, partners, and also our services. So our flagship partner is uh, Stratasys for plastic, uh, plastic printing. So we've been working with them for over 20 years now. We also represent desktop metal and exact metal for economical office friendly metal printing. Uh, we're also working with uh, post process for printing and support removal and part finishing. We are also a uh, partner with Universal Laser for uh, laser cutting, Artech 3D for scanning. Um, we're also, we also have uh, SimCare, which is our printing and technical support services. And we also have our professional services. So we're not only a value add reseller, for all these solutions, we also provide services. So for example, if you need scanning services or maybe you are up against a tight deadline and you don't have uh, on-site printing, we have the capabilities in house to get your jobs done right. And of course, we're also working with SolidWorks in terms of uh, 3D design. So uh, for the industry that we, that we serve, um, additive manufacturing is, pretty, uh, pre is present in nearly all industries and truly is a great fit for if you're making assembling or designing any form of product due to the lack of design li limitation. So just to name a few industry, we are working a lot with education, with schools around uh, Canada for university and college, uh, commercial product, defense, uh, aerospace a lot as well, automotive, consumer product. And as you, uh, as you all know, I'm pretty sure also with medical. So we're highly involved at the moment with different hospitals and uh, medical institution to support them with the COVID-19 crisis and by providing them also support for their production of PPE face shield, for example. And also we're having a lot of discussion around uh, face masks. So in terms of the, the challenges, so many challenges with manufacturers uh, face are common across all industry. Um, upper management and investors always want to, uh, to have more product with higher quality than yesterday. Uh, quality is something that is very crucial as well. 
um, any kind of mistake, especially relating to tooling can be expensive, not only to fix it, but more importantly for the loss of production time. And uh, most importantly, focusing on the employee safety will always drive innovation and generate creative new ways to accomplish your goal. So with additive manufacturing, that's something that we're able to provide. So in terms of the industry trends and what's fueling the growth, just to, be, to give you maybe a, a short story on that, uh, in 2009, there was a, a big pattern that expired and this opened the market to uh, a hobby level. So we were assisting to a, a lot of different articles talking about factory in every home, prediction of traditional parts manufacturers, warehouse, uh, logistics, logistics companies would be significantly disrupt. But in reality, at that time, it was mostly used for prototype but not even with a functional value. So as of today, we are still highly involved in the with the prototyping, but we're also able to provide a lot more of a different application with new materials that allow a uh, that strength of parts that is uh, way better. Um, so now we're also talking about, for example, uh, different metal system as well, affordable between uh, 100 and 250K. Uh, we're also there, we're also assisting to different kinds of technologies. We're all involved in different industries far uh, way beyond than only prototyping. And we're able to um, help uh, organization with different needs in terms of uh, a lot more of our applications. So in terms of the application in uh, additive manufacturing company, so like as like I mentioned, we are still highly involved uh, with the uh, prototyping. So we're calling that rapid prototyping, covering and uh, concept modeling and functional prototyping that I will be able to uh, talk to you a little bit more uh, in the next slides. But also, like I mentioned, manufacturing in terms of application for manufacturing ads, forming tools, and also uh, end use parts. So for our concept models, um, there are great opportunities to print a primary design to test the fit and form. Uh, adjustment are easy to make in early uh, in early design cycle and could save week and could save weeks or months from a later design stage, uh, and it can help also decision maker to visualize the concept which is being proposed. So the enablers for that are excellent excellent tolerance, uh, extensive material option, high resolution models, and also realistic material performance. For advanced prototype, we can think, of, uh, for example, of surrogate parts that allow for accurate testing using a final part simulate. It can help prove out an assembly line ahead of receiving final parts. And the high quality of materials combined with accurate first time right printing creates reliable parts. So the enablers for that are high performance materials, thermoplastic stability, and uh, accurate, excellent repeatable tolerance capabilities. So just to give you a, an example on that, so we will look at how GVL Poly used the F900 to shorten their development and testing time. Uh, GVL Poly is a roto molding company focused on the agriculture sector. So what they did is that they tested dozens of variation of wear point in one harvest season, uh, and the wear point is in, constant, is in constant contact with the ground. So for them, it was important to have a, a material that was durable and stable parts. So that why, that's, that's the reason why they decided to go with additive manufacturing by using ABS M30. So they were able to have, uh, to have high accuracy and a stable material and use and fill testing also as well. And they were able to reduce time to, mar to market from three to five years to only one harvest season. In terms of tooling and jigs and fixtures, in the tooling area, especially with jigs and fixtures, there are so many applications which are fantastic fits for additive manufacturing. So for example, we can talk about production and assembly, packaging and logistics, uh, transportation, and quality control and, its, and, and inspection. So um, also maybe just to give you a great case for, for a new material that was introduced uh, on the market for the engineering grade of the F123 line of Stratasys, um, there's the Durand, which is a non-mirroring nylon-based material that is really useful for uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of tooling and application. So what you can see uh, on this slide is uh, what we can call a traditional fixture made of aluminum. So as, as you can see, it's a very complicated build for the tooling shop and it, re it requires ca special capabilities ca such as aluminum welder complex angle cuts and accurate locating over multiple assembled and welded pieces. So they were looking for a, um, a new solution because they were facing many challenges 
uh, as of complex angles on frame, unfavorable uh, host routing, and also ergonomic concerns, handles, and remote uh, handle bolt. So uh, what happened is that we did what we call in the additive, uh, in the additive manufacturing uh, DFAM, which is designed for additive manufacturing. So it allows us to uh, be sure that the, the part will be adapted for 3D printing. And also it will be uh, to be sure that it will be efficient in terms of time of production, cost per materials, and uh, that it will be also uh, resistant enough. So uh, now what we what we have with additive manufacturing on, on this slide is the extremely lightweight fixture, which is still strong enough to accurately move parts. And is, the design is kept clean by root, uh, rooting pneumatic hoses uh, through the structure. And we were able to uh, have great result in terms of material cost, build time, assembly time, and uh, the final weight as well. So what we're seeing now is a 30% uh, reduction weight. We also have a 50% savings uh, compared to traditional weldment. And we're talking about a 30 hour build. Uh, and before, before that, we were talking about four to six weeks. So as you can see, the result is great. And we're able to save a lot of time and also uh, money on uh, our production. So just to give you another other example of uh, jigs and fixtures. So for example, it can be really useful for batch template and apply, uh, headlight aiming, uh, and also alignment, alignment fixtures. So the, there's uh, many options and uh, maybe many applications that additive manufacturing are able to provide in terms of tooling and jigs and fixtures. So in terms of toolings and also jigs and fixtures, once again, uh, it's also really useful for surrogate parts. So it can help build an assembly line or be used to ensure proper programming of CNC machine prior to cutting and expensive forging or checking for hospital crashes, for example. So uh, this is also a great option that additive manufacturing is able to, uh, to provide. So in terms of, of tooling, so uh, it's, a nice, it's a nice bridge to tooling that we're, what we're able to, to, to have with additive manufacturing. So just to give, just to give you some example, we can talk about sand casting, ingestion, ingestion molding, thermoforming, uh, fiber winding. So it's, we have many uh, different options and that's all available with additive manufacturing. So we have great opp opportunity to build a tool while waiting for a final metal design. It's, it allows to check for design mistakes. It's app applicable to many industries and we're able to get a final part with proper material uh, properties when, print when printed properties aren't close enough. So just to give you an example, so as you can see on this slide is a Alton plastic that is that is resistant to autoclave and stable and capable of being used for composite molds. So that's one of the uh, tooling that we're able to produce with additive manufacturing and 3D printing. And uh, that's something that it is really useful, uh, for example, in the uh, aerospace industry. So just to give another example, so with Piper Aircraft, uh, Piper was able to reduce the cost and lead time of hydroforming tool to build a personal jet. So they were able to print parts in 10 minutes while before it was taking hours. Um, so what they did is that initially they were producing hundreds of aluminum structural components, inner frame components, gussets, brackets, and skins. And they were uh, looking for a, another solution to improve their cost, but also improve their time. So uh, depending on the pressure required, many different option materials, there are many op the different option materials. So the cost of tooling can be very attractive and the life of the tool is great as bridge tooling uh, or for low volume run. So that's why they decided to explore uh, the FDM technology uh, with plastics. So what they did is that they use polycarbonate that can go between 3,000 and 6,000 PSI, Altum 985 uh, that can goes up to uh, 10,000 PSI. And they were able to reduce uh, the time of production by a lot, but also they were able to have uh, great savings as well. So what is the sweet spot? So the sweet spot is really for low volume production, rapid tooling and specialty end use parts. Uh, so when we're talking about a high complexity, for example, that's something that uh, would be in our sweet spot. But if we're talking about a really high volume of quantity, uh, there might be like other better option. So their sweet spot is, is really be between uh, a low volume production and also a, a, um, a uh, high uh, complexity if, uh, if needed. So in terms of end use parts, there are really uh, direct benefits that we can 
that we can see. So we can talk about lower costs, shorter lead times, and but there's also some indirect benefits as well. So in terms of design freedom, change freedom, uh, mass customization, and part consolidation, just to name a few of them. So maybe just to give you a, a quick example. So we recently delivered a course to George Brown College uh, prosthetics and orthotics program. So we taught the second year students to 3D scan the lower leg and forearm uh, design and 3D printed their orthotic device in 9 and 12. Then they fit the device to their fellow student uh, patient. And one student then went on a four kilometer run with uh, their ankle foot orthotic device. So this is one of many examples that we can provide you. Uh, but I think that this one is a great one in terms of medical uh, application. Uh, this is only to show you uh, that Airbus, that I'm pretty sure all of you know uh, as an airline company, um, manufacturing company, uh, they, they have produced for more than now uh, 1,000 3D printed in-flight parts, which is a lot, and it's working uh, great for them. For my next segment, I will talk to you a little bit more about the uh, materials overview in FDM. So there are three different categories. So in orange, they are this is the, the standard material. Then you have in gray the engineering uh, FDM material. And in yellow, it's the high performance uh, FDM materials. So we have over 16 different materials that are able in uh, different colors, depending on the materials. And these materials also comes with different soluble support as well. And not all of these materials are uh, available on all the printers. So it, it's also, it's also de it also depends on the model. So just to maybe talk to you about these uh, some of these materials. So in orange, for example, you can see the ABS M30i. So this is a material that can be sterilized for uh, medical application. So that's a material that we're using at the moment with different uh, hospital and supporting them with their production. There's the uh, ASA, which is a material that can resist to uh, UV light. There's the TPU in the end that I will be able to talk to you a little bit more in the next slides. In gray, if we go back with our engineering FDM materials, so you have PC, which is polycarbonate. You also have PC ABS, which is a, an, a polycarbonate ABS. So it has the same flexion than a standard ABS, but it's, uh, it's stronger that, uh, than an ABS. So it's a material that is uh, interesting. You, we also have PC ISO, which is a biocompatible uh, material and the FDM not in 12. And finally, in the uh, in the yellow for the high performance material, we have the Ultim 1010, which is the uh, FDM material with the IS uh, eight, um, the the IS uh, eight capabilities. We also have the Ultim 9085, which is a material that is that is well adapted for the uh, aerospace industry with the AICS certification, which means Aircraft Interior Certified Solution. And it's a flammable material as well. We have the entero, which is the uh, the material with the uh, with the IS uh, uh, chemicals capabilities. We have the Nylon 12 CF that I will that I will be able to talk to you a little bit, a little bit more, and the FDM Nylon 6 and ST130. So I was able to talk to you a little bit more about the uh, Duran earlier on. So Duran is a great material. Uh, adapted to different manufacturing markets. So we can talk about the automotive, aerospace, industrial, and automation, for example. Uh, this material is only available on the F370 of Stratasys that I will be able to talk to you a little bit more later on. So it's a great material for uh, tooling. It has a good lubricity. It's not. In, it's a non-mirroring material and uh, it's four times stronger than ABS. So it's well adapted for jigs and fixtures depending on the uh, different kind of application. So. Um, as you can see, we're not only just printing PLE or ABS part, there are so many options available and well suited for different kind of uh, application. For the 9 and 12 CF, I also wanted to take the time to talk to you a little bit more about this material. So this is the, the material with the highest ratio in terms of weight and resistance. So just to give you a couple of numbers, if we compare this material to other uh, nice material as well. So in terms of IS tensile strength and, and also flexural strength, as you can see, this material is very performing well. And it's a great material depending on the application also um, for, for tooling, but also depending uh, of, the, uh, of the industry, that's the material that, that is also very popular in the automotive industry to give you an example. And the last material that I wanted to talk to you about is the TPU, which is a material that is available also on the F123 series. Uh, so this is an elastomer material, so it can resist to a lot of uh, impacts. 
and it's also a material that have a, that has a lot of flexion. So this material is also really useful for different kind of industries. So I also uh, it's also a great material for the automotive uh, industry and different kind of applications. So that's something that we can use around, for example, uh, intakes. It could be depending on, on what it is exactly, but for pedals, just to uh, name you a few examples on that. For my next segment, I want to talk a little bit more about the different technology available on the market. So the first one that I want to talk to you about is uh, FDM, so which is under uh, Stratasys that we are offering. So it's the material is our thermoplastics, like I mentioned to you. There's also Polyjet under Stratasys with a different kind of material, so with UV curable resins. We also offer a different metal solution, that, like I mentioned earlier. So we are a partner with uh, Desktop Metal for uh, FDM metal uh, technology, but also with uh, bound metal rods as a material. And finally, we offer exact metal with direct metal laser centering um, with metal powders. So just to talk to you a, li a little bit more about the uh, Stratasys uh, overview in terms of FDM system. Uh, so there are different systems available on, uh, on the market uh, that we are offering with Stratasys. So just to give you a, a range of, uh, of pricing between these solutions. So it, it, it goes from 12K to half a million US. Uh, depending on the application and what we're looking for and also on the materials that we want to uh, to have access so in terms of the f123 series there's the f120 that give access to abs and also uh, asa with the bail plate of 10 per 10 per 10. we also have the f170 that give access to uh, also pla and tpu as an option uh, with a similar bail plate of 10 per 10 per 10. There's the F270 uh, that give access to the same material with, with but with a bigger bail plate, uh, plate of 12 per 10 per 12. And uh, to complete the F123 series, there's the F370 that give access to uh, the, the RAN material that I was able to uh, to talk about a little bit more earlier. And also it give access to a bigger bail, bail plate uh, of uh, 14 by 10 by 14. Uh, if we go to the advanced uh, manufacturing, so there's the Fortis 380, the Fortis uh, 450 also. So maybe to talk to you a little bit more about the Fortis 450, we uh, now the Fortis 450 give us access to a build plate of 16 by 14 by 16. It also give access to all the uh, engineering and high performance uh, FDM and materials that I talked to you about a little bit uh, earlier on. And uh, also it's a really uh, great machine for, uh, for production uh, as well. And um, finally, we have the F900, which is the biggest uh, print, uh, the, big, the biggest printer with the FDM system. So we're talking about 36 by 24 by 36. So it's uh, it's a lot it's a lot bigger, and it's also give access to uh, all the engineering and uh, also the the high performance uh, materials of FDM. So in terms of uh, Polyjet, which is another technology that we offer. Uh, under uh, under Stratasys with the UV curable uh, photopolymers. So it's for extremely high quality printed parts in full color. So we're able to print different color at the same time, depending on the system and also different kind of material and textures uh, at the same time. So that's why it's really interesting depending on what we want to, uh, to achieve. So that's something that could be really interesting for prototyping, um, medical also, uh, medical uh, purposes and also uh, then the dent some dental purposes as well. So uh, there's a new digital anatomy printer with accurate material properties to help mimic human tissue that is now available on the market. And uh, Stratasys recently added the J826, which bring the full capability of the flagship models into a more affordable and smaller package. Under Stratasys, we also offer the SLA technology. So it's a great option uh, as well, depending on what we want to, uh, to accomplish. So just maybe to, uh, to give you an idea of SLA and how does it stand between the other technology uh, in terms of the uh, me mechanical properties, uh, the FDM is the, the best technology for that. So SLA is not as performance as the FDM technology in terms of mechanical properties, but in terms of surface finish, it, it will be uh, better than the FDM, but uh, it won't be as performance as performant as the uh, Polyjet to give you an example. So it's something between uh, the Polyjet and the, and the FDM technology, just to give you a uh, roughly an idea uh, on that. But in terms of application, SLA could be really useful for casting, for example. 
uh, in terms of the uh, ex with exact metal for for so one of the uh, of the company that we represent for a uh, for metal production so it's a very good small footprint option that allow companies to enter the direct metal laser centering so we're able to have access to uh, different materials and the technology is direct metal uh, laser centering like i mentioned so with the uh, the power bed fusion so it's a great option to have access to a high performance uh, metal uh, 3d printer and also uh, really affordable if you compare to uh, under uh, option on the market and it's able to produce great a uh, great part with a lot with a lot of details and eye complexity as well so for also uh, singing the metal uh, in the metal production so we also I also spoke about uh, talk about uh, the desktop metal so which is uh, with the BMD with bound metal deposition so it's something similar than FDM not not totally the same thing but the material is uh, is we add the material layer by layer so it's the it's with the fusion of wax and also with the fusion of uh, of the uh, of the of the material that we're able to uh, create a um, kind of a stick that is applied layer by layer uh, the process is quite different so we need to print first then it will be uh, it will be uh, the binding and then it will be centering to be sure that uh, the, the the part will be uh, would be would, would have great great uh, cap capabilities and will be strong enough also so in terms of uh, post process, so this is also a great solution to improve uh, your, your post process. So um, it's all, we also have different options depending on the technology. So it's, it could be something good for FDM and Polyjet. It's uh, intelligent technology based on part cleaning, on uh, on pre-made recipes as well. So depending on what we want to accomplish, there are different options that are uh, that are available. So, for example, if you look at the 40, this, um, this is a good option for FDM, SLA, and Polyjet. There's also the Raider that is good for SLS, FDM, and SLA. And the DC Duo would be good also for SLS, SLA, uh, just to give you uh, some, uh, some, some option about, about post-process and their solution. We're also working with, uh, with Artec in terms of, uh, of 3D scanning. So we, we are offering different models depending on the application and what we want to scan. So as you can see, there are, there's this, the, uh, the Space Spider, Eva, Leo, and Micro. So maybe just to give you an idea of uh, the different uh, options that we have. So if we're looking at the Space Spider and the Eva, if you want to, um, to, to scan a, a old car, for example, you, the, the best option in that, in, in that case would be with the Eva. But if you want to only scan a, an engine, and uh, now the best option might be the space fiber for So depending on this, the surface that, that you want to scan, we do have different options that we're able to provide uh, with, with our tech and with also different kind of, de of technologies. So if I talk about technology with Leo, uh, was one nice feature is that you don't need to have, for example, a computer with you when you're scanning, but you can have access directly to your scan from the small screen that you're able to see on, on, the, on the Leo. And uh, with this product, in terms of so of surface uh, that we're able to scan, it's something uh, even bigger than the EVA, uh, but it will be less precise than Space Spider if we're looking for something smaller. Uh, we also have the, the micro, like I mentioned. So if you want to really scan something that is really small, uh, in that case, a micro might be a, a, a great option for that. So with Artec, we're, we're, we are really able to, um, to assist different kind of industries and different kind of companies. So we are able to provide help in terms of the industrial design, healthcare, uh, entertainment, fashion and design, human body, uh, just to give you some example uh, of, uh, about that. And uh, Javin has worked with companies to ensure their success with scanning and to provide our scanning services. So why our tech for us is pretty simple because we are able to have access to, uh, to scan a broad range of objects with the uh, different Artec scanners. Uh, there's the iframe rate capture, uh, highly accurate fuse models, um, no requirements for consu consumable targets. So as you can see maybe, or if you did uh, explore different options, there's a lot of different scanners on the market that requires uh, targets to, uh, to scan. So it's, it's more complicated and it takes more time. So with, with, our, with our tech, it's really easier. And there's uh, most options can be battery powered, uh, powered as well. Power as well, and uh, we can combine scans from multiple scanners to get an uh, to get an extremely accurate section uh, on a large part.
Thank you very much for that overview there. That's really informative to look at additive manufacturing trends and some of the use cases that uh, we've had experience in and we could help with as well too. So that brings us to the conclusion of the webinar today. So again, uh, make sure to fill out that survey. Um, the winner for the two space mice will be picked in half an hour and also the 3D printing services voucher, all that good stuff. So please give us your feedback.